So I wheeled him around here to the corner here like this. I went bang, just knocked him down. I had no other thought and I just went bang out with the fucking blade. I went fucking crash. So what did it feel like when you drove that knife into his throat? Oh, well, done a hundred times, mate. It doesn't feel like anything. No, you don't even feel it. Violence has always been part of my life. I've been in street fights, lost friends to gang violence and family to war. As a nation, violence is justified, demonised and glorified. I want to explore violence, but to do so, I need to understand our relationship to it. Underworld enforcer Graham Abu Henry terrorised the streets of Sydney throughout the 80s and 90s. Together with his partner Nettie Smith, they were involved in murders, commercial heroin operations and large-scale robberies. Their gang was given the green light by the New South Wales Police, allowing them to commit whatever crime they wanted as long as they shared the loot, kept civilians out of the way and didn't kill any police officers. But Graham couldn't help himself. After a night of drinking, he cut the throat of a police prosecutor. We're going to go visit a few of the old haunts with Graham and talk about violence. My forte was robbing armoured vans. I sold fucking tons of fucking hash and got millions doing it. I was the boss of everyone. You ran a pretty large scale heroin operation that was greenlit by the coppers here at the Star. You know, we didn't fuck around. You know, if you uh, stuck your head into our business and or you were doing the business in our area, and you were going to pay a fucking penalty. What were those penalties? Oh, well, you know, it might go from fucking breaking their legs, stabbing them, fucking bashing them. You know, they might go worse. They might disappear. Describe what you mean when you say you guys were green lit. Well, the green light actually meant that we were f nearly free from prosecution for just about anything that we did. You know, within reason. Not take things into the public, not hurt any police officers, otherwise it was the end of the help that they'd give you. We did everything. Everything where there was money to be earned, we stuck our head into it. You, you know, you started to spread your tentacles, you know, because that's what organised crime is. It's like a giant fucking octopus, mate, you know? The head's the think tank, the arms stretch out into every part of society and the suckers are gaining the information on what robbery we can do, what we can get here. In 1984, Graham's gang was about to self-destruct. Nettie Smith was spending more time with notorious hitman Christopher Rent-A-Kill Flannery. And when Graham's share of their earnings went missing, he walked headfirst into an assassination attempt. Once that money was missing there, I knew I was going up there to walk into a hornet's nest. I knocked on the door, and as I opened up the door, there was Chris Flannery, the hired gunman from, from yeah, Melbourne, the yeah. hitman, right? And he had his hand under a pillow just sitting right beside a big pillar. It was the first thing I noticed. And uh, Ned and two others from my gang. And Ned and that had some excuse and fucking left in a hurry. Well, bang, the hair on the back of my neck was up. Chris is the only one left there. I just walked up and uh, I just started casually talking about Ned and everything. I said, where'd, uh, where'd your big mate just go? He said, oh, fuck, if I know about you know. Well, he started to gesture with his hands. When he just said with his hands, his hands come away from the gun. I fucking pounced on him. You know, grab his fucking hand, jam mine fucking straight in his mouth. I was probably a fucking, I don't know, fucking two seconds from fucking blowing his brains out. And the fucking door opened. And this fucking woman walks in who was a barmaid from the Lord Nelson Hotel. I still got him in me, in me fucking hands like that. He was going fucking down. I didn't give a fuck one way or the other. But when that girl turned up that I knew, I just, I just, I just fucking couldn't do it. Because I, I, number one, I put her in a bad spot or I got to kill her. I'm not going to kill her, you know. I do have some principles, you know. And my principles are that I don't fucking tell and I don't fucking kill women or have anything to do with anything like that. He went missing in, on the 9th of May, 1985, I think. Graham Henry likes to boast about the acts of violence he's committed. So to separate the facts from bravado, we met with Clive Small, the ex-assistant commissioner of the New South Wales Police, who was responsible for investigating the corruption in Sydney throughout the 80s. Crime was growing, the opportunities for crime were growing, weapons were increasing, and the criminals were far more um, violent towards one another, generally speaking. 
How corrupt was the New South Wales police force during that time? There's no question that there was corruption at both senior and junior levels. There were occasions when they were involved in the violence, perhaps in a direct sense, but uh, more likely in a um, indirect sense. That is, Nettie, we know you did it, but thanks for the money, we'll forget it. Do you think the green light made the Nettie Smith and Graham Henry gang more violent? It probably made them more violent and more frequently violent because they thought they could get away with it. It, it was pretty messy. How violent do you think some of the crimes were that Nettie Smith and the Graham Henry gang got away with? Oh, I, I think there's a number of murders. Henry actually carried out some of the violent acts for Nettie Smith, including a couple of shootings, but they weren't murders. That they were shootings where the person was injured. Henry was the planner and organiser, but it was Smith who spent the time partying on and carrying on. It was Nettie who was the uh, prolific front page story. And that was because of the violence and the way he behaved. After speaking to Graham Henry, he claims that the police were in fact working for the gang, not vice versa. Smith would say, we're going to do a hold up or a drug deal or something. The police might say, well, hang on, we've had a look at that. Um, don't do that because of this. Each was doing favours for the other. So it was a two-way deal. And I guess you'd probably say ego. It's a matter of perception. Geez, I'm glad we're not doing a robbery. Jesus. <laughs> You'd be in a lot of trouble, Marmot. You reckon I could cut out as a good no, getaway mate, driver? No, you'd be sacked. You'd be in the boot by the end of the day. <laughs> why, do you reckon, why do you reckon I'd be in the boot? Oh, man, you're a bit fucking ordinary on the road. I reckon road, I'd make good. It's, these, it's the roads you've got in Sydney, mate. Oh, right there. So, where are we okay. off to now? We're going to go to the Lord Wolvesley. Could you tell us about the violence that deeply affected you growing up in your house? My father was a returned soldier from the Second World War who came home with, I guess, what everyone calls today post-traumatic stress disorder. He, he'd go up and he'd drink his piss up the pub, then he'd come home and he'd have his tablets. Well, well then he turned into a fucking maniac. My mother had one leg and uh, he started flogging her and uh, uh, flogging her like, you know, he'd punch her like a fucking prize fighter. I used to stick my head into it and he'd fucking give it to me and the same thing had happened. So by the time I was about 13, I decided that I, I'm going to go and learn to box. So I went over to North Sydney Police Boys and I said to the uh, trainer there, I said, mate, I want to learn to fight. And he said, what, to do it as a sport? And I said, no, I want to learn to fucking do it so I can fucking batter me father. I come home one night and looking around and walked out in the kitchen and then I saw her all this blood. So I followed the blood and there she was under the house. Well, when she came out of there she had blood clots. Ever seen a blood clot? In her hands from fucking coming out of nose, her fucking ears. He'd flogged her. I kicked that fucking door in. I ran up the hallway, got a barbecue fork and come back and plunged it in his face and his chest. But uh, he went to Wright Hospital and the police come around and, uh, and no one ever said nothing. So he never gave me up, and which was good of him. And uh, that was really the end of him fucking bashing me mother. Do you reckon you know? that taught you that violence in a way works? Well, that it violence, gets results? Well, violence served me. That was for sure. In your book, you state that there's a, an overwhelming sense of calm that comes after outbursts of violence. Yep. Was that pertaining to what happened in your childhood? or is oh, it probably, or it probably it was the release, you know. It was that release valve in you because I, I had no idea how to relax. Ever since I was a kid, I, I didn't have any outlet. What do you say to people that are disgusted by violence, though? Oh, well, and they think it's really they just They just haven't... Uh, been down the fucking roads we have, I guess. Look, we all get brought into a different fucking part of fucking life, mate, man, and come in a different way. You know, they're very fucking clever and their parents are smart and they help them along the way. I guess when you haven't had that and you come about from fucking knockabout areas and fucking you come from violent fucking background, well, it's going to fucking unfortunately fall into you. I mean, I had the smarts to be a lot of things, but I was a fucking, you know. Did you enjoy the violence? Yeah. When I was younger, yeah. 
Yeah, look, even today, if I had a fucking fight today, I'd fucking, yeah, I'd be glad I had it. Why do you I'd think, feel why good do you after think that it. is? I don't know. Pro probably you'd just feel good after it. We're at the Lord Wolseley Hotel here in Sydney. In Oldermo, yeah. Yeah, it brings back a lot of memories, this place, mate. You know, the, the main event that really happened here that, uh, you know, uh, fucked up my green light with the, with the uh, New South Wales Police was uh, the stabbing of uh, the uh, local prosecutor, Malcolm Spence. That t last time I saw him, he went and ran bragged to a bloke and said, oh, I fucking pulled him up out of go and he fucking shit himself. Yeah. And I said, oh, I fucking did he. Well, late November, 88, I walked straight into here, standing right there, right in the doorway there. I said, come out here. He said, no, I don't want to talk shop tonight. Mean them business, you know? And I said, no fucking business here tonight. Get out here, follow me. So he followed, he just, he just fucking he put his drink down and followed you? Yeah, he followed me. So I wheeled him around here to the corner here like this. I went bang, just knocked him down. He got up. I wanted him to get up because I wanted him to have a fucking go at me. You, you know? wanted to fight him? I wanted to fight him. I wanted yeah. to fucking have it out. Otherwise, I wouldn't have fucking done anything else to him. But next minute he started fucking going, oh, you fucking, mate, I fucking sorry about it. I thought, you weak fucking dog. I had no other thought and I just went bang out of the fucking blood. I went fucking crash. I just got in on the ground and I fucking plunged it straight into his fucking neck here. So what did it feel like when you drove that knife into his throat? Oh, well, done a hundred times, mate. It doesn't feel like anything. It just feels like a fucking going into a sponge or a fucking piece of fucking forecorder. You know what I mean? If there was a fucking lump of meat there and you went like that, you, went, you don't even feel it. Would you have stabbed him if he had fought you back? No. You, you no. wouldn't have stabbed no. him if he fought you back? No, I would have just punched the crap out of him. Why? I would have been grateful that he had a go at me and showed some balls. When he fucking didn't, that's when I lost it. But uh, that night he, he went in the back of the ambulance and, um, and uh, unfortunately I uh, went to prison over it. All that I can recall is the morning, I just fucking thought to myself, yeah, fucking idiot. You know, I was filthy on myself. A lot, a lot of people say you've been a career criminal. Yep. Have you got any regrets? Yeah, that I stabbed the prosecutor. Only one I got, man. You don't regret the actual violence of it, though? No, not at all. Mm. No, I don't have any regrets about it.